Now, what I wish to do in this lecture is to look at three major Turkish confederations that emerge between the 5th and, uh, really, uh, the 9th centuries AD. Uh, these confederations, in some ways, are um, similar to what we saw under the, uh, the Shuang Nu, uh, that is the confederation of the, uh, really, the end of the 3rd, 2nd century BC that poses a threat to China. And in this lecture, I want to concentrate a lot on the Turks themselves. We will talk a little bit about China, uh, the interaction between China and uh, these uh, Turkish nomads we, we, we shall reserve for an upcoming lecture. In any case, the first confederation we know about uh, emerges in the 4th century AD, somewhere in the 330s, and there are a group of rulers uh, who go by the name of Khan, Ka'an to be more exact, and that uh, gives rise to names such as Kagan. Uh, the Aver Khans who uh, put together uh, the first significant confederacy of Turks on the steppes. They would be centered again on those eastern steppes, uh, particularly on the Mongolian grasslands. Now, there are several features uh, or several advantages that the Turks had acquired uh, by the opening of the early Middle Ages. One of these is superior saddles, and with superior saddles, stirrups. We believe as early as 300 AD, nomadic peoples had devised what is often called the leather loop stirrup. It's essentially a toehold attached to a rather high back saddle that would give you more support in riding. It would assist the archer in steering his horse and using both hands uh, for his weapon. Well, these leather straps gave way to metal stirrups. And metal stirrups are attested certainly from the 4th and 5th centuries A.D. on. Uh, they are very, very quickly adopted by the Chinese. And when we talk about the clash between the Chinese and Turkish armies in the Sui and Tang dynasty, uh, the Chinese are armed just as well uh, uh, as the, uh, their Turkish opponents uh, with better leather saddles and uh, that metal stirrup. There also were certain improvements in the composite bow. And above all, uh, the Turks turn out to be extremely skilled metallurgists. They perfect the forging of iron and steel. In fact, the name Turk, which comes to become a general name for people speaking all of these related languages, that's a term that was originally applied only to those speakers of Turkish living in the Altai Mountains, who are really vassals of the Avar Khans, and they got their claim to fame because they were excellent metal workers. They could produce fine armor, the conical helmets, the various scimitars and battle axes needed for a close order fighting. And so at the start of what we would call the Middle Ages, certainly by uh, the 4th and 5th centuries AD, the Turkish nomadic warriors are far better armed and equipped, have far better saddles and stirrups uh, than any of the earlier nomadic peoples, the Shuang Nu, the Tokarian speakers, the Saka, and therefore they are a far more formidable cavalry force. And invariably, these nomadic armies now have a component of what we would call heavy cavalry, lancers, uh, men who could close and fight in close or order. They have the body armor and the weapons, uh, as well as uh, large numbers of horse archers who would open the attack uh, by harassing the enemy, wearing them down, luring them into a premature uh, attack. All of the Khanates uh, that we're talking about, uh, the Avars, the Gurk Turks who follow them, and then the Uyghur uh, uh, Turks, all of them field similar armies, similar type of, of, of armored uh, warriors, horse archers, and they employed uh, the same tactics and strategy. And remarkably, these tactics and strategy will dominate the battlefield uh, really uh, into the 15th century. And, and as I've mentioned before, it's only the advent of firearms that really um, undermines uh, this entire uh, uh, system of fighting. And you have to understand that these Turks are trained from birth to fight as warriors, to hunt, in fact, the famous kind of polo game played by Turks still survives across Central Asia and, uh, and into Mongolia, Buzkashi, which is a rough and ready polo uh, played with the carcass of a goat. And it's a pretty brutal sport. 
and a sport that also trained you for the kind of expert horse riding that would require men to ride within 10 or 20 yards of the foe, shoot arrows into him, flee before the enemy can re even react, uh, then turn on a dime uh, to counterattack uh, should the en enemy give you that opportunity. Well, the Avars, as best as we can determine, were Turkish speakers, and from uh, 330 AD or thereabouts, uh, down to a rebellion that was carried out by their subject Turks in the Altai Mountains, a man named Buman, who in 551, 552, overthrew the Avars. They dominated the eastern steppes uh, based on these armies. And they were able to negotiate terms with the dynasties then ruling in China. And we will return to these dynasties in China in the upcoming lecture. Uh, and these included particularly Chinese emperors of what are known as the Northern Wei Dynasty. And what they really were, were related Turks, called in Chinese sources the Toba people, they have a variety of names, who have established themselves uh, in northern China, in the Yellow River Valley, along the Great Wall, although the Great Wall is falling out of use because they really don't have the resources to maintain it, and they are nomadic warriors trying to rule northern China in the guise of, of Chinese emperors. They also clash with the Hephthalites, probably Tocharian-speaking people who succeeded to the empire of the Kushans, who attempted to dominate the Tarim Basin and the cities of Transoxiana. That is, those wealthy caravan cities that really net so many advantages to the nomadic peoples. So the Avar Khans repeatedly negotiated with the emperors of the Northern Way. Uh, they exchanged embassies as well as lots of border wars with the Hephthalites. And as a result, they get in on part of that trade, again, to acquire the silks and the other goods that allow the Khan uh, to rule a confederation of inner and outer tribes. Well, I mentioned that very abruptly, uh, somewhere in 551, 552, uh, a vassal ruler of this confederacy, a man named Buman, uh, who ruled a group of people who come to call themselves the Gurk Turks. And the Gurk Turks means the Sky Turks, the Celestial Turks. Uh, Gurk is still a Turkish word for sky. It means the blue sky. Uh, it's associated with the blue color. And it's probably a Turkish version of the, um, the notion of the Son of Heaven in Chinese ideology. Uh, they overthrow the Avars very rapidly. It's essentially an internal rebellion. Uh, and Buman had a uh, private quarrel uh, with the last uh, Avar uh, Khan. Uh, he had been denied a royal marriage. Uh, there had been a, um, uh, really had been some kind of uh, a dishonoring of him. And his followers were particularly well armed because they had been uh, the people producing the weapons uh, that armed uh, the confederacy of the Avar Khanate. And as a result, Buman, who, who dies soon after the rebellion, uh, establishes the second great Khanate on the steppes. He seizes the traditional regions, the uh, Orkhan Valley. He is acclaimed Khan by probably an assembly that already resembles the Kurlatai, that is the, uh, the assemblies of rulers, of Khans and princes, uh, who give their approval to the man who will lead the confederation. And this is a feature of not only various Turkish confederations, but also the Mongols. Now, the significant point about the Gurk Turks is they do not confine their activities to the, just the eastern steppes, the Tarin Basin. They are responsible for a very rapid expansion of the Turks across the central and western steppes. In the course of the 6th century, Turkish speakers now extend all the way into those Pontic Caspian steppes, penetrating uh, to the shores of the Black Sea. Uh, to the steppes around the uh, Caspian and Aral Seas. And they come into contact with the Sassanid Empire and the Byzantine Empire, as well as with the various kingdoms in China. Uh, they're not yet quite reunified until 581 under the Sui dynasty, but this Turkish confederacy borders on all three of these great literate urban civilizations. And that expansion sees several important changes. It begins a linguistic transformation of the steppes. The Turks prove extremely um, adaptable in learning as well as assimilating other steppe peoples 
who up until this time, up until this time, mostly spoke Iranian languages. And between the 6th century AD, when literally Booman gives his brother, um, Ishtemi, his, his younger brother, the commission, look, you go, you go west, you pursue the Avars, who eventually run, they end up in Western Europe, they actually end up ultimately in Hungary, uh, trying to flee uh, the Gurk Turks and enter into alliance with Constantinople in part to escape the, their overlords, their would-be overlords, the Gurk Turks. Uh, he tells his brother, Istemi, you run these guys down and bring the various other steps under control, which he very successfully does. And after Booman dies, either in 552 or 553, shortly after he overthrew the Avars, this Khanate essentially divides into two. There is the Eastern Gurk Khanate, centered on the traditional homeland, and there is a Western Gurk Khanate, which centers on the central lands and has aspirations to bring the Western steppes under control. This is not just a matter of lateral succession, but also a matter of size, that the military abilities of the Gurk Turks are so great, they're able to incorporate so much of the steppes under a single confederacy, uh, that uh, that forces a political division because of questions of time and communication. You have to remember that Bumen is uh, ruling in the uh, Turkish heartland in what is today central Mongolia, uh, close to the later capital of Genghis Khan, and that is 3,000 miles away from where his brother is operating on the shores of the Caspian or fighting uh, the Sassanidid Shah in Transoxiana. And you just cannot rule this state uh, from a single center. And so this, this partition of great khanates becomes a feature ever after, and it is a major feature of the Mongolian Empire, the Mongol Empire conquered by Genghis Khan and especially his grandsons. Uh, the second important point I mentioned, of course, is that you have a major linguistic and ethnic transformation going on. Uh, that is, Turkish languages now become uh, the language of the steppes, and with that comes a sort of cultural koine, koine uh, that unites the various steppe peoples uh, henceforth. And uh, also, uh, this uh, is a matter of power. The khanates, uh, the um, Gurk Turk khans, have military power on an order that no one has seen on the steppes really. Uh, at least the central and eastern steppes uh, since the time of Modu Chan, Chanyu and, uh, and the Shuang Nu. Well, this eastern Khanate uh, runs into trouble. It draws the attention of the Chinese emperors, particularly the Tang emperors. And the Tang emperors in 618 unify China into a great military state. And they immediately target the northern lands as a region to bring under control. And we'll be discussing the Tang emperors. They find the reintroduction of that tribute system that is providing Chinese brides, uh, bolts of silk, uh, uh, in exchange for some kind of submission, as well as access to the horses of the steppes. Uh, that is unacceptable. And the first Tang emperors rule virtually as generals and conquerors themselves. And I will argue, to some extent, they are products of the martial society of northern China. And as a result, uh, the Tang emperors wage major wars against these Gurk Turks. The fighting climaxes in a campaign in 629-630, when the Chinese general, and he's, he's well known from his military manuals, a man by the name of Li Jing, uh, is commissioned to wage a major campaign against the eastern Turks, and it is a perfect strategic operation and envelopment. He nails the army of the Khans, destroys them with the kind of tactics we've discussed before, and as a result, the Eastern Khanate collapses. Thousands of Turks are captured. They're sent back to China uh, to serve into the Chinese army or settled as colonists. In 657, Tang armies also inflict a serious defeat on the Western Turks in Central Asia. And by 657, really down uh, into the 680s, the central and eastern steppes are literally being ruled by the Chinese emperor. The Tang emperor, the second Tang emperor, uh, Tai Tsung, uh, could style himself not only as the emperor of China, but also effectively as the Khan of the nomadic peoples, 
the people of the felt tents. Uh, and this was a major achievement. No other uh, or, uh, urban civilization, uh, organized army of the entire Middle Ages or even of antiquity ever won such victories as, uh, as the Tang Emperor did. However, uh, this could not last, uh, and the Tang Empire went into uh, a decline, uh, particularly brought on by the uh, An uh, Lushan Rebellion, which breaks out from 755 to, uh, uh, to 763. We'll discuss that in the up upcoming lecture. But what happens is that the weakening of the Tang Dynasty allows the Turks to reestablish their independence. They shake off the control of the Tang in a rebellion in 680, 681, and we have a remarkable set of inscriptions that were set up by these later restored Turkish Khans in the Orkhan Valley, and these are the earliest examples of Turkish. They're written in a runic script, a script that looks a lot like Germanic runes, but is unrelated to it, and in it, the man who is what is known as uh, Yabgu, uh, that is a subordinate Khan, his name is Toyukuk. He put the Khan on the throne, the Khan uh, Bilge, and he has a long inscription, in which, is, which is quite significant because it's the first time we have direct evidence from these nomadic peoples. And he, uh, Toyukuk, warns his Khan and his people not to become too assimilated by Chinese ways, uh, not to build Taoist temples, not to build Buddhist stupas, uh, to be careful in the material culture, and above all, not to lose the military virtues. Uh, uh, this is an issue that will be raised again in the Mongol Empire, as well as Turkish tribes who enter into the Islamic world. Uh, now, uh, the, the inscription, which is today, uh, and the whole site, uh, which is regarded as a World Heritage uh, Site, uh, is known to all Turkish speakers today. Any Turk would know, yes, that is the first Turkish uh, that we have, uh, and the modern Turkish languages are still fairly closely related to that early form of Turkish from the 720s, uh, uh, those inscriptions uh, really marked the height of the Gurk uh, Turk uh, Khanate. Uh, within 20 years of those uh, inscriptions, uh, the Khanate collapsed. It was overthrown again by subjects, that is a subject tribe of the Confederation who were also Turks, uh, between 742 and 744. A new group of Turks known as Uyghurs, they are known to people who have been following the news in the relationship uh, between the Uyghurs and the Chinese in Chinese Turkestan, or Xinjiang. Today, we used to call it Xinjiang, but they're not there yet. They're actually on the Mongolian steppes. The Uyghurs uh, construct uh, the third Khanate. Uh, in some ways, they represent a new improved Khanate over the previous two. Their power doesn't extend as far west. Essentially, the western zones even much of the central steppes was loosely affiliated with this Khanate. But the Uyghurs are important for several reasons. One, they very quickly come to embrace Manichaeism. Uh, there is an official conversion to that faith uh, brought by Sogdian merchants. Uh, the Uyghurs uh, develop their own script, uh, ultimately based on the Brahmi script. Uh, they quickly also establish settlements. Uh, they turn their, uh, their tent encampments into what look like incipient towns. Uh, and the Uyghurs uh, establish a very, very close relationship uh, with uh, the caravan cities and with the later Tang emperors. And that results in important cultural influences emanating from China and from the caravan cities of the Silk Road uh, entering into the eastern and central steppes. Uh, and that is um, uh, one of the most important roles they play. And as a result, the Uyghurs, among all of the Turks, were regarded as the most accomplished and civilized. This is, for instance, uh, documented in their political uh, dealings with the Chinese Empire. Uh, we know of uh, 13 different Uyghur Khans. Seven of them, uh, essentially half, married Chinese princesses. And these would have been women who arrived from the Tang court. Some of them were of the imperial family, other from high members of the court. Uh, they would have arrived with great retinues, would have been received by the Uyghurs. Uh, and uh, that was a, they're essentially equivalent to grand caravans. And with it came artisans and entertainers, uh, scribes. And the Uyghurs were extremely receptive to all of these cultural influences and really enriched uh, the society of the eastern steppes. 
They were tolerant of all the religions, even though uh, they favored um, Manichaeism. And uh, when we turn to the Mongol Empire, the Uyghurs were regarded as the natural administrative staff uh, for the Mongols. Genghis Khan immediately starts, as soon as he's on his world conquest, he's using Uyghurs uh, to run his empire. Uh, they also allow the dissemination of Nestorian Christianity and Buddhism across the eastern steppes. Well, the Uyghur Khanate also lasts uh, for about a century before it too is overthrown. And again, it is overthrown by subject tribes. The capital is destroyed in 845. It's abandoned. And the successors, uh, these Kyrgyz Turks, who are the ancestors of, of today, the Turks of Kyrgyzstan, they essentially overthrow Uyghur power and then leave. And many of the Uyghurs migrate into the cities of the Tarim Basin and eventually uh, merge with the sedentary populations and bring their language and their traditions there. Well, I want to stop with a couple of conclusions about these three Turkish Khanates. They were the dress rehearsals for the Mongolian Empire, the great Mongol Empire of uh, Genghis Khan. And second, they forged more uh, impressive uh, political organizations and brought the Turks into contact with the settled civilizations very intimately. And above all, with the civilization of Islam, which is soon to emerge. And it is it is the great interaction uh, between the Turks and Islam that will change the life of the steppes and also change the emerging Islamic world.
Мавзолей Худжахмеда Юсаи за много веков не раз подвергался как реставрации, так и большой опасности. В 1864 году по его куполам полил из пушки русский генерал Веревкин. Я вот очень не люблю, когда люди начинают делиться, вот русский, казахский, украинец. Мне кажется, все равно вот мы живем в Казахстане, значит мы все должны быть казахами.